This is Legislative Review on Prairie Public. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest is the Senate Minority Leader, Senator Max Schneider of Grand Forks. Senator, thanks for being here. Dave, thanks for having me on. I, you know, we're in just a few first few weeks of the session. Has anything really emerged to you about what's different about this session? Well, I think what's different, at least initially, is that there's really not this incendiary piece of legislation out there. And so that is a welcome news on, 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 my, on my part. It's just getting those fighting Sioux bills out of the way, not having to worry about those, that, that's been a welcome relief, and I hope it stays that way. Uh, obviously, the falling price of oil is sort of something that's hanging over the session and something that, that we'll have to deal with, and it's going to affect everything that we do. And that's why we've advanced the idea of contingency budgeting during this uncertain time. So we've got a lot of challenges, but we really have unlimited opportunity here in North Dakota. This dip in the oil market, it's serious, but it's not something that we can't weather. You know, everybody is saying that, that, you know, it is a concern, but it's not time to cry chicken little. The sky is falling. That's right. It, it, the sky is not falling. We certainly want to make contingency plans in case the price of oil is, is low for at least the, the, the near future. Uh, but at the same time, the worst thing that we could do is overreact to, to the price of oil as well. And so it, through this process of contingency budgeting that we're going to be trying to advance throughout this session, the goal is really not to, to overspend if we don't have the funds. But also, if the funds are there, uh, we won't have had to walk back our promises to Western North Dakota, to schools, to taxpayers. So we think it's just a sensible approach to the uncertainty that we've, we've experienced this session. I may ask you about annual sessions after a bit, because <laughs> there is a bill in about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people who have been longtime observers of the legislature, and they're, they're all saying the same thing. And it was, I think the analogy was, it's like two boxers first round, mm -hmm. just kind of feeling each other out, nobody really throwing any punches or anything like that. It's just because the oil price is, mm -hmm. is the real uh, X factor. Uh, that is exactly right. And we've got a, a lot of issues that are coming up. I think that the, the pace might change a little bit here uh, as we get into budgeting for higher ed, as we get into funding for K through 12 education, as we debate, debate uh, pre-K and all of those issues. Certainly the surge funding bill uh, is heating up in the Senate. So we've got a lot of issues. And I think that this, the other shoe is going to drop here in terms of the pace picking up this session. You know, you mentioned higher education and uh, some <coughs> of the other spending uh, issues. Let's jump into higher education mm -hmm. because the, the higher education budget was before, I think, was it House Appropriations? I believe that's correct, yes. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about tuition freezes. There's been talk about the legislature taking back control of setting tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been debate about that. And, of course, higher education's had a rough go of it over the last several months. Mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective and the Democrats' perspective, what mm -hmm. do you think? Well, I represent the University of North Dakota. About half the voters in District 42 are UND students, and so there are few issues that are more important to my district than higher ed and college affordability in particular. You mentioned freezing tuition. I have co-sponsored legislation to freeze tuition. I've either sponsored or, or co-sponsored that uh, every session. We absolutely should do that. Uh, the level of debt that our kids are taking on to go to college in the state, it's, it's amongst the highest in the country. And it's absolutely not acceptable considering North Dakota's economic good fortunes. And, you know, higher ed has had its challenges. College affordability, uh, first and foremost, in my mind, uh, amongst those. But we really do have a great system. You know, we want to make improvements around the edges, and obviously the board shouldn't be violating open meetings laws. But at the end of the day, we're all very proud of NDSU, UND, and, and all of our campuses across the country. So I'd like to see us go forward with good faith uh, analysis of where we can improve uh, our higher education system. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater either. Do you think it is a true system? It is. It, there, there are academics and people with green eye shades who I think would debate that a lot better than I could. But I think it, it is more a conglomeration of campuses than it is a top-down, chancellor-driven system. And, and there are pros and cons uh, depending on which side you're on on that. But I, I do think that uh, we've, in large, we have something very good going on with higher ed, and we can take it to the next level with the good fortune that we've seen. With the resignation of the Board of <coughs> Higher Education president and the ascension of the vice president, vice whatever, and a new chancellor possibly coming on board within the next year. Where do you see higher education? What do you think the main challenge is now to the higher education system? Well, these, these skirmishes and the what I think is unfair treatment of Ms. Diedrich, I, I hope it doesn't detract away from the opportunity that we have when it comes to higher ed. Uh, I'll be advancing a proposal. I believe it will be bipartisan at the end of the day that would take the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund and create a merit-based scholarship endowment. That's something that will fund access to higher education in perpetuity. And so 
as we go about you know these daily battles over higher ed, let's not take our eye off the ball long term. We we do have great uh, campuses in the state. Uh, we've got tremendous opportunity, and, and we've got to take advantage of that, and not get sidetracked by some of these these fights that we see. I want to follow up on something you said about uh, Kirsten Diedrich being treated unfairly. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? I just think it became more an issue of personality rather than policy. I think it's perfectly fair to say that tuition should be lower. It's perfectly fair to say the board needs to do better when it comes to open meeting laws. Uh, but I think what happened to Ms. Diedrich more approached political blood sport, and I think that just detracts from the process. Is it some residual effect that the Measure 3 did not pass? I hope it's not something that petty, but I, I can't say that that's not part of that. Uh, I, there, there is a certain segment of the legislature that they have it out for higher ed. Um, and I, I think the vast majority of legislators, Democrat and Republican, I think they want to improve the system. And so I'd like to see us go forward with those kind of good faith discussions about, about higher ed rather than you know, more battles over, over personality. Now, to talk to your proposal about taking the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund mm -hmm. and having it a scholarship program, what kind of traction are you getting with that idea? Well, I, I think it's been pretty well received, and obviously the, the proposal's not in the hopper yet. We're still working on the fine-tuning. want to get as much buy-in as possible before you uh, drop something that, that's that bold. Uh, but the, the idea is a pretty basic one. We have this this fund, the Sleepy Fund, Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund. It's it's boring in title, even. <laughs> uh, but it's brimming with about a about billion dollars. We've only used it, I believe, once, and it was about 20 years ago, to stabilize uh, foundation aid, you know, payments to uh, elementary schools and, and secondary schools throughout the state. So it's a fund that's really outgrown its purpose. And you can have this nearly $1 billion endowment uh, to fund access to higher ed forever, essentially, without taking away from any other priorities. So I really see it as, as seed corn. You know, we, th this time of uncertainty caused by low oil prices should be a soft lesson to us that in the long term we want to diversify our economy. And I'm not sure what the big industry is going to be 50 years down the road, but I, I, can, I can bet it would take an education to get it. So I think it's a great way to take this one-time uh, development uh, of, of our natural resources and the revenue that's come from that and make a permanent investment in our people. Well, you mentioned the one pot, which is the, as you said, the kind of the boring, sleepy fund. <laughs> but there are other proposals <clears throat> to dip into it, one for a school loan construction mm -hmm. fund, also to uh, pay off the defined uh, benefit retirement plan mm -hmm. and get employees new state employees go into a defined contribution plan. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm not particularly enthusiastic about using this fund for a retirement purpose. I think this is an education fund, and so I think we can have you know disagreements about where that should go, but let's try to keep it in the realm of education. A revolving loan fund for, for education, that seems to be an appropriate purpose too. And so what, what the size is of this endowment, I think that's something the legislature should have a good debate about. Take a look at Wyoming. Uh, their Hathaway Scholarship Endowment, I think it was about $450 million, and that provides a, a lot of access uh, to higher ed in that state for, that, for Wyoming's best and brightest. So uh, you could do a lot with a $500 million endowment and still have some left over uh, for a revolving loan fund. So it should be a fun debate to have. It's, it's something where we can think big thoughts and, and plan long-term for the future. Speaking of thinking big thoughts, you know, there's been push for pre-K education and child care. And it's stalled in mm -hmm. previous sessions. Mm -hmm. Is there momentum now to do something on that? I think there is. And I want to give a lot of credit to Senator Joan Heckman and Senator Phil Murphy for their leadership on this issue. Uh, Senator Heckman being an educator, uh, Senator Murphy is an educator as well, married to a kindergarten teacher. And they've advanced this issue uh, for, for every session that they've uh, been in the legislature. And you look at nationally what's happening, states like Alabama, Alabama, Oklahoma, Georgia, uh, you know, ruby red states that are moving towards universal pre-K. This is something where North Dakota is, is way behind and we absolutely have the resources to catch up. And so you're gonna see a proposal that would essentially guarantee access to pre-K for, for every, every four-year-old in North Dakota. Uh, and if we don't get there this session, we're gonna get there next session. It's something that absolutely is the right move for the state. Which is interesting in that you're a, you represent a border town. Minnesota is going through some of the same issues too with pre-K. Uh, that's right, and you know Minnesota is ahead of us. Nearly every other state is ahead of us when it comes to pre-K. And so, North Dakota, we can't say it's a matter of a lack of resources. It's just a lack of political will. But I think the the, the wheels are turning on that. And certainly, Senator Flackle's advanced a proposal uh, as well, co-sponsored by Senator Heckman. And so, I think there's agreement, at least in the Senate, that we all should move in the same direction. I guess you know we'd like to take it a little bit farther in that direction. 
Yeah, the, their business <coughs> interests who are basically saying this is a good idea. Yes. Yeah, even you know, just childcare is a good idea that they've been they've been crying for it because of the lack of workers. Yes, it, it's a both a short term and a long term workforce issue. Uh, when four year olds have access to pre K, that's not only a wonderful education and a start in life uh, that they wouldn't otherwise get. It's also childcare and, and quality childcare at that. And so, and then long term, obviously, they're going to have the benefits from starting out their education uh, appropriately with that that early childhood development that they'll get from that. So, it, to, to us, it's really a no-brainer. For a very minimal investment in the grand scheme of things, you can really start kids off on the right foot. It's absolutely something we should get done this session. Since we're on the education bandwagon, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the Common Core debate, which, mm -hmm. which is going to happen first in the House. Mm -hmm. And there are hearings scheduled, I believe, on February second. Uh, from your perspective and your caucus's perspective, mm -hmm. Common Core. Well, it's really more of an intra-Republican Party food fight at this point. Uh, I, I don't uh, I see anything wrong with the current North Dakota standards, and I think that's important to understand, too. This isn't something that was foisted upon us uh, by the federal government. This is something that North Dakota adopted. And really, the sort of intense debate about Common Core really distracted from a lot of these other issues. Our goal in this state should be, with our, our tremendous wealth that we have, it should be to have the best education system in the country from early childhood through postgraduate. And this fighting over Common Core, I think, just takes away from that. So you're, if you were a betting person, would you bet the Senate's not going to see that bill? I, I almost hate to jinx things, Dave, <laughs> but uh, I, I would guess that it's going to be a very brief but very intense fight uh, on the floor of the House. And then I think uh, the effort to repeal Common Core uh, will be defeated. Now, that is just one person's guess. Anything can happen here, uh, but certainly I that's the result I'm hoping for. Yeah, of course, as a session winds its way and twists and turns, you never mm -hmm. really do know for sure. <laughs> you never know. I, I've, I've, this is my fourth session. I haven't been here all that long, but I, I've, I've tried to stop predicting things, at least without uh, hedging it a little bit. Since you mentioned that you're in your fourth session, uh, let's go back to what I was talking about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Compare this session with previous sessions you've been in. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot has changed. Point, yeah, and every session is different. Uh, when I started in 2009, uh, there were 26 Republicans and, and 21 Democrats, yeah, a little bit of a, a different environment in terms of political balance. And I think that really had an impact on the process. Uh, I think it forced both sides, um, Democrat and Republican, to focus on bread and butter issues. And I really think that that's, that political balance is something that we want to get back to. I think it, the output at the end of the day is, is good public policy for, for the state of North Dakota when you have that sort of balance. So uh, that was a big difference between 2009 and, and uh, 2011. Uh, this session, I think the uncertainty with the oil prices, that a little bit different from, from last session. And so I'd like to see us going forward in future sessions, you know, planning for um, more budget volatility. You know, understanding that we can have good times like, like we did in 2011, we can have uncertain times. Times are still good, but they're a little bit more uncertain now. And so we're going to have a budget a volatility study that will be introduced next week. And, you know, we're just going to have to get used to the, the ups and downs that we're going to experience with this commodity. Uh, but we have no control over that. We do have control how we react to it. And so I'd like to see us have, have more of a proactive approach to, to this commodity that goes up and down. It's funny you should mention commodity because you talk to people in the <coughs> agriculture industry and they're saying, see, I told you so, <laughs> because they, they're familiar with the ups and downs. Uh, that's right. And, you know, in the near term, we want to budget for contingencies. You know, I think we should do that this biennium. I think there's some support on the other side of the aisle to do that. We want to have a budget, budget volatility study to make sure we, we better can protect against some of these swings. And then long term, let's diversify our economy so that we're not uh, dependent on the price of oil uh, as much as we are now when it comes to our budget and funding things as, as important as K-12 education. So that should be the goal for the state. To underline this uncertainty, of course, uh, Representative Carlson, when he was on the show last mm -hmm. week, talked about a Republican budget mm -hmm. and, you know, having the Republicans put, you know, put together their own budget forecast. Mm -hmm. Have you heard whether or not there will be a budget forecast? Have you been privy to any of the discussions? I, I haven't been privy to any of the discussions on the, the so-called Republican budget. I can tell you that. We, we will take projections and good ideas wherever they come from. But at the end of the day, I don't think we have a Democratic budget or a Republican budget or a legislative budget or even the executive budget. I think you have a budget that builds for contingencies or 
it either overspends or forces scarcity when when scarcity doesn't doesn't need to happen. And so uh, there should be ideas that are heard from whatever sector, uh, Republican, Democrat, executive, legislative. But what we've seen in the past couple of sessions is that the revenue forecasts really are inaccurate. And that's not anybody's fault. It's just things are changing so rapidly in North Dakota. And so we should plan for whatever is going to happen. And you can do that if you build in contingencies into these appropriations. It almost sounds like you're making the case for a an annual session. <laughs> the fair question, fair question. I, coming into this, this session, I, I was against annual sessions. And uh, as you know, Dave, Representative Onset and I previously called for a special session to address some of the uh, impacts in Western North Dakota. I felt very strongly we should have called a special session, uh, but that really is up to the governor. A and so I would like to see us go to special sessions more than we uh, should be enthusiastic about going to towards annual sessions. But the uncertainty surrounding the price of oil is sort of you know, turning me towards uh, annual sessions. What I would hate to see is if, uh, in a push for annual sessions, we take a step closer towards professionalization of politics in North Dakota. Um, uh, th that would be something that I think takes away from what we have now. But if it's a serious you know, budget planning discussion, it's intensely focused uh, once a year, you know, I could go for something like that. So I'll take a look at those proposals. Uh, but I'm. My, my views are evolving on this one. Senator Gravinger's bill would basically say keep the 80-day pro prohibition or the 80-day mm -hmm. cap, mm -hmm. do 50 days one year, 30 days the next year, and maybe mm -hmm. the even number of years could be a mm -hmm. budget session. Well, Senator Grabinger has been very persuasive with me on this. He's, he's approached me personally on it, and I, I'm going to take a good hard look at that. I, I would, if we can handle our work every other year with a special session here and there. I, w I would prefer that to automatic annual sessions, but uh, of the proposals that I've seen out there, Senator Gravinger's is certainly the best. Since money seems to be really the driving thing, <coughs> driving thing in most sessions, but it really so much this year with the price of oil, yeah. March forecast becomes that much more important, I assume. No, a absolutely. I and the March forecast may be inaccurate in April. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? I mean, we had a, a pretty detailed revenue forecast in December before the holidays, and that's basically out the window now. And so I, I, we're going to take a close look at that forecast, but at the same time, you can't bank on it. I don't think anybody has a crystal ball in terms of how long this the, the era of low prices is going to last. You know, by most accounts, it has legs. Uh, we have to prepare for oil being low for the foreseeable future. But at, at the same time, you can't take that to the bank. Let's just plan for any contingency that's out there so we're not overspending, so that we're not leaving these priorities unfunded if, if oil uh, comes back up again. You know, it's interesting. Before the session started, we were was talking to the governor and, and some, other, some other people, and they said, look, we've got the money to fund the 15, 17 priorities. The problem's going to come in 17. Yes. But then one of them mentioned the legacy fund mm -hmm. because the legacy fund becomes somewhat available in 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you still have that card that's in your pocket. I, I was a member of the Legacy Fund Initiative, and this was one of the most rewarding things I've ever been in, able to be a part of in, in my public career. And it's a group of Democrats, Republicans, people with no political affiliation, leaders in business, leaders in nonprofits. And, and for a year, we took a look at the possible uses for the Legacy Fund. And the, the scenario is really quite amazing. If you reinvest 75% of the earnings in the legacy fund, you could be looking at a, a legacy fund that's several hundred dollars in about 50 years. I mean, really fun to think what kind of long-term resource we could have for the state of North Dakota. So I would hate to see us look at the legacy fund in the short term as a rainy day fund. I don't think that's what the legacy fund's for. I think that's the people's share that we're always going to have regardless of how much oil we draw out of the ground. Um, we do have other funds out there, the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, Strategic Investments and Improvements Fund. And so with this long-term budget volatility study that we've advanced, I'd like to t us to take a look at the other funds besides the Legacy Fund, and maybe we have, maybe we bump up the Budget Stabilization Fund uh, to, vo to guard against this volatility. But I, I would say our state would have to be in very dire straits before we look at tapping into the Legacy Fund. That would be unwise to do so under any other circumstances. On the volatility study, how do you approach that? <laughs> it would be difficult. You'd have to unwind a lot of, of legislative action, you know, creating all these little budgets and 
If you've ever looked at the flow chart, it's just mind boggling. It is almost impossible to understand. And that's why I think we need to take some time in the interim, you know, potentially consolidate some of these funds that haven't been used for a while or haven't been used for their intended purpose for a while. And you say, this is the fund that we are going to use to guard against the kind of swings that we've seen on the downside uh, this session. So it's going to take some long-term thought. It might take undoing what we've done, but I really do think there's some benefit to the state and, and some in more predictability in budgeting if we do that. You know, there are a number of bills that are in the hopper to give tax relief, a lot of income tax relief bills. Mm -hmm. There are a couple sales tax relief bills, uh, one on the internet, one on clothing. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, where are we going with tax relief in this session? I, I think the priority has to be on the tax that people are concerned about, and, and that's property tax relief. Uh, you know, I took in Representative Carlson's comments on eliminating the income tax, and respectfully, I believe that would be unwise. Uh, number one, I don't hear a lot about the income tax. It wasn't too long ago in 2008 that voters rejected a measure that would have cut their income tax uh, in half, essentially. And so I think that's a clear message that voters want us to focus in on the property tax. And that's what we'll be doing as a caucus. Senator Jim Dotsonrod from, from our caucus, one of the most knowledgeable uh, members in the entire body uh, when it comes to taxes, he'll be advancing a proposal that would exempt the first $100,000 from the value of a primary residence or ag land. Uh, Senator Tyler Axness is going forward with a tax credit for renters who have felt the uh, effects of the increase in property taxes that we had previously seen. And so that's where our focus is going to be fairly and squarely, uh, not eliminating the income tax. Is there going to be enough to do property tax relief going forward? Well, I think we need to take a look and make sure that we're committed to those promises that we made in terms of sustainable tax relief. And Senator Dotsonrod's bill is a good way to do that. The relief is focused on those who own homes in North Dakota, those who own farms in North Dakota. Uh, Senator Axon's proposal, those who rent in North Dakota. And so I, I think you'll see us continue the property tax buy-down that we've essentially advanced for the last three sessions. But I'd like to see us focus deeper property tax relief on those primary residences. And, and it's easier to sustain because it's not just buying down K-12 through education mill levies across the board. I think in this time of uncertainty, it's a good way to, to, to cut property taxes. What about property tax reform? Not just relief, but reform. Absolutely important, just critically important. I think one of the big ways that we can do that is take a look at incorporating some of these county social services and having those become a state responsibility. That's dollar for dollar property tax relief. State is probably a better position to fund those considering the different revenue we streams that we have uh, compared to what counties have locally. And so th that's one step. I think there's some support uh, on a bipartisan basis for that, and we'll be discussing that as we get deeper into the session. In a couple minutes we have left, are there any pet bills that we haven't talked about that you're kind of watching? Uh, well, I don't know if this is pet bill. The, the, the subject matter is very serious. Uh, human trafficking, uh, I'll be introducing legislation that, that goes after the, the demand side of human trafficking. Um, let's just face it. This is a hard fact for us to face, but if there wasn't a demand for commercial sex in North Dakota, there wouldn't be human traffickers here. And so my legislation would increase uh, penalties on the Johns, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. It uh, would also provide for uh, an education program that could be ordered by the court, uh, make sure that these individuals who had previously engaged in this behavior, make sure they understand this isn't a commercial transaction. This is something that's inherently exploitative. Um, so that'll be dropped in the hopper next week. Uh, something I, I think the Attorney General has done well, uh, Chairman David Hoag uh, has, has really uh, focused in on this issue. And so when it comes to human trafficking, it's not Democrats, not Republicans. This is the state of North Dakota pulling in one direction and making sure these people don't do business here. Sounds like you're working toward more of a comprehensive <clears throat> attack, if you want to put it that way, on the human trafficking problem. That, that is really uh, what it's been. And I've been so proud of the way the system has worked. Uh, it's not only increasing penalties against human traffickers, which everybody can get behind. It's also no longer prosecuting minors uh, who are victims of human trafficking. It's the also Safe Harbor Bill. The Safe Harbor Bill, providing funding for victims uh, to make sure that they have access to services and are rehabilitated. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, you're not going to be able to prosecute human traffickers unless you take care of the victims. Those are the key witnesses. Uh, and then also uh, sensibly going after the Johns to take down the demand. Uh, that's You're looking at it from all sides, and I'm very hopeful we'll make some progress on this uh, unfortunate issue. I have to ask about this, the, the, the idea of creating a new state park mm -hmm. uh, south of Bismarck, moving the MRCC, the Missouri River Correctional Center out. Mm -hmm. 
Where do you come down on that? I think it's great. Uh, some of those, uh, th that area is just some of the most beautiful uh, scenery that we have in this state. Uh, on slow days at the end of the legislative session, try to go down to that area and go for a jog if I can. And so it's been a while since we've created a state park. I don't think we've created one in my lifetime. I could be wrong by a year or two there. But uh, so I, I think that's uh, that's just critically important. Uh, so more people can enjoy the, the great outdoors that we have here in North Dakota. I forget how young you are. I think Frost <laughs> Ranch was the last park we created. Okay. And so. not sure when that was. But I was I was created in 1979, Dave. So okay, <laughs> the first session I covered. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Uh, anyway, the basically the Republican Republican leaders have said they want to do 75 days and keep five days in reserve. Mm -hmm. Can you accomplish that this time? I, I sure hope we can, and I certainly would be supportive of keeping five days in reserve, and and maybe that'll force us to focus in a little bit more. I think both of us remember day 80 of the 2013 legislative session. Uh, Representative Carlson, Senator Wardner, and I sitting around a table for legislative management at about 6 in the morning uh, when it when all was said and done. So I think we're just catching up on sleep uh, now <laughs> after that, as a matter of fact. So I, I certainly would, would support the majority leaders in keeping five days in reserve if we need it, and maybe we can even get out in 75. Who knows? Sounds good. Senator, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate Dave. the time. Our guest on the program Senator Max Schneider from Grand Forks, he's the Senate Minority Leader. For Prairie Public and Legislative Review, I'm Dave Thompson.